welcome to week number four of Divine Direction. It's a teaching series that uh, we've put together and, and we want to open the door, right, to God's absolute best for you. It, it is not what you want. You want God's best for you. And every day, each of us, every one of us walk through doors. We make decisions. And we've been learning throughout this series that our future is not determined by where we started out in life. It is not even determined, your future is not even determined by where you currently are at. But your future is determined by the decisions that you make today, by, by the doors you walk through tomorrow. Well, one touch from God in the future can, can take you to a whole new level. Listen to me, if you're in middle school or if you're in high school, th this series, honestly, can be a whole blueprint for your life. That this can help you experience the, the kind of life that you were built for. Uh, this kind of thing. If, if you walk through these doors, this will help you. If you're in your 70s or 80s, you, you got to know that this series ought to remind you that it is not done, it is not too late, it is not over. If you're all messed up, you're somewhere in, in the middle of this and you wish to God, literally, that your life was very, very different, listen, I, I'm asking you to listen. This is stuff that will help you, to help you get the kind of life, not that I want for you, not even the kind of life that maybe right now you want, but the kind of life that God has for you better, better than the life that you can imagine. We're live streaming this morning to Bathurst and to uh, Chatham. I want to welcome you. I want to welcome those of you that are listening in online. And I want to invite those of you here in Newcastle or wherever you happen to be uh, tuning in, if you missed week number one, week number two, or week number three, get yourself online to thepointchurch.ca, top right-hand corner, make sure that you click on On Demand, and you can watch or you can listen and get all caught, caught up. And, and, and week number one was foundational. Week number two was important. Week number three and, and today. So, so don't cheat yourself. Don't miss out. In fact, if you're used to uh, downloading all sorts of apps on your phone or on your tablet, wherever you get your apps, you go and you search out the Point Church and uh, you look for that orange arrow and you download this. And even on your app, you can watch or listen uh, and get yourself all caught up. But don't miss the opportunity before us. So divine direction. Again, if you truly want God's best for you, if you want to have the full life that you were designed for, a life of meaning and a life of purpose, then I believe that that life is not only available to you, but it is exactly what God wants for you. Now listen to me. God does not want you to obey a list of rules for His good. He wants to have a relationship with you for your good and His glory. And those two things go hand in hand. When you're living the kind of full life with meaning that you were designed for, then God gets glory. And when God gets glory in your life, you end up living the kind of full, meaningful life that you were designed for. So back in week number one, we said if you want God's direction, His divine direction in your life, if you want His best for you, if you're wondering what the blueprint of life ought to look like, you need to settle the foundational question, who will you serve? Who will I serve? And I told you about the Old Testament story of Joshua who said to the children of Israel, who is it? Choose for yourselves this day who you will serve. And I joined with him. And I said, you're going to serve someone. You're either going to serve yourself, your spouse, your boss, the bank, your kids. You're, you're serving someone. Choose today to serve God. 
Believe that, that when you put God first, He will look after the other things and put them in their proper place. I, I invited you in week number one to step into, if you remember, with both feet. See, too many of us have opened the door to church or to religion or, or to God and we've put one foot in and we're testing the waters. And we're wondering why we feel so stuck. We, we don't have the fullness of the experience of God and yet we're not even fully experiencing the joys and the pleasures of this world anymore. And, and the challenge is for us to jump in with both feet. To, to really put God in first place to live your life according to the principles that God has laid out. And, and when we settle that question, when we get that right, uh, man, everything begins to fall into its proper place. In week number two, we said if you really want to make God first, if you want to figure that one out, one of the things you need to do is you need to start changing your mind. We, we need to think differently. And we said that in the same way as you're going to serve someone, choose deliberately and intentionally who you will serve. I said you're going to think something. Choose intentionally and deliberately to get into agreement with God. Believe what God says about you more than what your mom says about you, more than what your co-workers say about you, more than what your partner says about you. Believe more than the voices in your head. Believe what God says says about you and choose your thoughts deliberately intentionally get into agreement with God see when we make the right big decisions we keep saying the little decisions take care of themselves and when we think the right thoughts when we decide who it is we'll serve and what it is we'll think about uh, we, we start to see real change, real transformation happen. Romans 12, 2, we've been saying it's, it's by the renewing of our mind that we see real change. It's then and only then when we start thinking differently that we get this divine direction and we know what God would want for us. In Romans 15, 13, we, we realize and we see, we get to read really how important this thinking is. May the God of hope, the, the God of helping you believe, the God of helping you think differently, fill you with all joy and peace. Oh, that's what we want, joy. Not, not, not just a belly laugh, deep down joy and, and real peace. Well, How do I get it? We trust in Him. We, we put our belief in God. We get ourselves into agreement with God. And when we do that, when we see that happening, that's when everything begins to change. Last week, I, I said, if you're going to serve God and if you're going to think differently, well, what are you going to say? And I introduced you to a lady in the Old Testament, right, who in the face of everything going wrong, continued to say, it's all right. Last week, uh, I was shaking hands here at the Newcastle site, and as people were leaving, I would say, hey, how you doing? And person after person would <laughs> smile and say, uh, I, I, uh, all right. <laughs> I'm doing all right. We've we got to believe for that. We, we've got to shift our, our minds, and, and we've got to start saying and speaking what we believe. I mean, you're going to say something. Most of you talked this week, right? Maybe not as much as me, but most of you had something to say this week. And we need to be deliberate and intentional with our words. We learned that our words are revealing, that sometimes our words are condemning, but, but that our words have the power to rescue us, we saw in Scripture. And we also saw that our, our words have the power of life and death. And so, how you doing? Are, are you changing uh, anything? Are you putting the big rocks in first? I mean, have you wrestled this one to the ground? Who is it that I will serve? Who is it that I will check with first when I'm making a decision? What is it that you've been thinking? Have you begun to make the shift? Are you putting anything in place 
that when your mind starts to go down the wrong road, that you catch yourself yet? I mean, are you starting to, to catch yourself, to move yourself from the negativity that the enemy has got you convinced that, that you are defeated, that you are done, that there is no hope, that things are getting worse, that one thing after another is going wrong? When, when you start swirling down that toilet, have you put a little sticky note on the dash of your car? Have you given yourself a little reminder? Is there something on your fridge? Is there, have you done anything? Are you starting to, to think differently? And, and are you still talking about the problems? How, how big the problems are or how big your God is? Because if you'll do these things, you'll start to experience real transformation. You'll start to experience real change. Something has got to give. And, and I believe that if we'll get these, these three big rocks in the jar, if we'll not get stuck with one foot on, on both sides of the doorway, that we can walk in and we can experience the fullness of a relationship with the living God. Let me tell you, the, the truth is that even when you get these three things in great order, not everything is going to go your way. Some things are going to appear to fall off the rails. The Bible said, Jesus himself said, in this world you will have trouble. Just because you do everything right doesn't mean that everything right is going to happen. That there are still going to be disappointments. There are still going to be wrong things in your mind that, that happen. Things are not always going to go our way. None of us, first of all, get all these things done perfectly. But even if we did, God loves you too much to leave you where you're at. If you're still living, He's not done with you. right? He still wants to, to stretch you. He still wants to grow you, to, to change you. you. You might look like this, but, but He's got big dreams for you. And what you desire is, is this. But, but what his desire is might look very, very different. God's got a, a bigger and a better dream for you. And in order to get you to the place where you need to be, to, to reach your full potential, sometimes things are not going to go your way. You can... Choose to, to serve God, but we're still going to have trouble from time to time. Even if you think, even if you uh, believe and, and trust in Him, even if you talk differently, um, not everything's going to work out perfectly according to your plan. Psalm 37, 4, we, we know this to be true. I take delight in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. And we love that. that that's a promise. God's going to give you the desires of you, your heart. What, what you want for, what you wish, what, what you long for, He will do it. He, he will do those things if we don't ignore the first part of the verse. Take delight. Shift your wants and your wishes toward not what you see as being so good for you, that this is exactly what I need and how I need it and when I need it. God's ways are bigger. And they are better. In fact, Isaiah 55, 8 reminds us, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. You might think that you know that this person needs healing. You might think that you know that this person shouldn't have walked out of my life. They, they should be walking into my life. You might think differently than what God thinks. My thoughts are not your thoughts and neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. It comes down to control issues. At the end of the day, it's this surrendering, it's this saying, God, I'm going to serve you. And in the face of everything seeming like it's going wrong, I'm going to see things differently. 
My dad passed away about 22 years ago, and you can believe I prayed for a different outcome. I, believe, I prayed and I believed and I trusted for healing and uh, for all sorts of, of things. I, I did not, my, the desire of my heart was not to say goodbye to my dad. In, in fact, after he passed away, I would flip through the newspaper and I would look at the obituaries and I would compare how old my dad was compared to other men uh, that were dying in the newspaper. And I didn't think it was very fair. I didn't think it was very godly. I didn't think it was right that my dad died when he died before he got to do all the things that I thought he should do. And yet, I wonder if I would be where I am today if my dad was still living. See, before I accepted the call to come here to this church, I processed a lot of things. And one of the things I did is I went and sat by my dad's graveside, all by myself. I didn't pray to my dad, but I certainly thought a lot about my dad, and I prayed to God. And I asked God to, to help me to, to know what I should do. And, and, and there, was a, there was a part of me that was moved and, and stirred because my dad wasn't here. See, I believe that I'm exactly where I should be. Living the kind of life that I should be li living. Uh, you know, far from perfect, but I am incredibly happy. God's looking after us incredibly well. I mean, to other people they would say, oh, poor Kevin, to me, I'm living the dream. I I I've got a wife that actually seems to love me and a 14-year-old that loves me too. That, that I love. I've got a, a job and a ministry with meaning and purpose. I mean, what more could I want? I get to go on vacations. And I get to, pe to, to lead people into a relationship with the living God. What, what more could I, I want? And, and yet I want my dad. And yet I know that the shape I am is not the shape God wants me to, to stay in. He wants to stretch me. He, he wants to change me. And He wants to do the same for you. The God who, who stretches, who changes, who grows you. I mean, he, he loves you, but as you've heard me say, He loves you too much to leave you where you are. He wants to see you change, to reach the fullness of all that He's designed for you. And so in an effort to keep you all awake today, I, I want to remind you that when you see an elastic that, that, and you feel like you've been pulled back, that, that you, have been, that, that you have, uh, been, been having setbacks and pullbacks and disappointments and you are stretched to the point of, of breaking, I mean, wake up everybody, uh, those, the, the further that I, I pull this back, the further that I pull this back, the further that it goes. And, and your setback, what, 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 what you're being pulled back on is really God's setup. He's, he's stretching you. I mean, if I pull you back a little bit and you stub your toe, hmm, you know, there's not a whole lot comes out of that. Get yourself a headache? Well, God will you know, do something with that and, and God can use anything. But I mean, when we're talking about grieving and loss and and all sorts of awful, awful things. I mean, those are big things. Listen to me. The next time you feel at the end of your stretch, like there is just nothing left in you. Don't you, don't you focus on how close you are to breaking. Please don't, don't focus on, on how bad it is, how much it hurts. <laughs> Look at it differently. I mean... I mean Think, I have decided that I am going to step in with both feet to serve God. And although I'm thinking the right thoughts here, God, and, and I'm saying everything's all right, even in the midst of that, let me ask you, let me invite you, be determined that, that even in the face of, of these things, that you will walk through door number four differently. And door number four asks this question. What will you do? What will you do when things go wrong? 
when, when you're stretched to the limit, wake up, folks. When you're, when you're stretched to the limit, I mean, the last thing we want is these to fall in anybody's mouth, you know, choke on one of these if you're sleeping, um, right? But, but, but when you're stretched, when you're pulled back, when, when you just can't take it anymore, what will you do? What will you do? Way back in Genesis, Jacob, who's also called Israel, he had 11 sons, and son number 11 was Joseph, his favorite. And that little distinction almost got him killed, right? You know, you know Joseph looked at disappointment after disappointment after disappointment, even when he was doing all the right things. And the wrong things were happening. He was determined to be different. I mean, how we handle the disappointments in life can either propel you to a whole new level or position you for even more problems. <laughs> Joseph had some brothers that, that were really... Uh, jealous of him. Now Israel, also called Jacob, I mean, he loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he'd been born to him in his old age. He was the youngest of 11 sons. Now as the youngest child in my family, you know, him being the favorite makes perfect sense to me. Right? Yeah, like I know. Like once you get it right, you can just stop that stuff, right? And, and so, uh, I mean, it was great for, um, uh, for, for Joseph to be the favorite until, until this. His father made an ornate robe for him. You've heard of the coat of many colors? Uh, Joseph's coat of many colors? I mean, that, that, that was a constant reminder that, that Joseph is the favorite. That Joseph is the chosen one. And, and good thing after good thing seem to come to, to Joseph. But when you're the favorite, sometimes that, uh, that's not all good. I, I remember once, um, and only once, um, all, all the people in my class in this activity that we were doing, they, they started to, to figure out that, that I was the teacher's favorite. And... and and eventually, this, this started to grow, and, and the teacher said, I have heard that lots of you think that Kevin is my favorite. Kevin is my favorite. <laughs> I mean, she might as well put me up on a cross kind of thing. Uh, I mean, honestly, I just was ridiculed and scorned, and it was awful abuse. It was terrible. It really was. Sometimes, being the favorite not so good. Joseph started to get visions. He started to, to dream big dreams. And when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of the rest of them, they hated him. I mean, it wasn't just that they didn't like him and they wished ill upon him. They couldn't speak a kind word to him. They hated him. And as more and more good things started to happen, and he started to have these visions and, and predicting that, that someday uh, his family, all of his brothers, even his mother and his father, would bow down before him, that he would be a ruler. Well, you can imagine how well that went over with some jealous brothers. When, his, when he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? I mean, will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? I mean, his brothers were jealous of him. They, they, they wanted him dead. They, they hated him. But notice his father just kept the matter in mind. Kept the matter in mind. See, as one good thing after another happens to Joseph, these guys let their jealousy take over. That they begin to actually plot against him and kill him in the wilderness. 
Uh, they, they, they have decided, they've got the way, to, they've got a pit and, and they're going to leave it or leave him in it to, to die until his oldest brother says, whoa, 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 we can't actually kill him. And so they decide to instead sell him into slavery. <laughs> that, that's nice, eh? You, you, you've got a, a disappointment in your life? you got something that you're feeling a little disillusioned over or, or set back or, man, I wish things were different. At least you haven't been sold into slavery, right? And, and, and so he gets bought by um, Potiphar, this high-ranking Egyptian who, who not only recognizes that, man, there's something special about this Joseph guy, I mean, everything the guy touches seems to turn to gold. It flourishes, and it's, it seems to be blessed. Wow, this guy is my favorite. This guy is, is, is incredible. I mean, whatever he touches turns to goodness. And goodness knows he ends up Potiphar with a wife who wants Joseph to touch him or touch her in the most uh, intimate of ways. And, and, and it turns out that, that she puts the moves on Joseph. And, and he does the right thing. He runs from the situation. He flees from it. He doesn't want anything to do with the adultery. He doesn't want to, to, to do anything uh, against his master, right? And, and so he runs, and then he's wrongfully accused. Uh, not just accused. He's wrongfully imprisoned. I mean, he's doing the right thing and wrong stuff's happening all around him. He knew who he was serving. He knew how to think. He knew what to speak. And yet, he was faced with awful, awful situations. Wrongfully imprisoned. I mean, disappointment after disappointment. That the guy was, was stretched to the limit. And, and yet, Joseph decides to do the right thing. He's determined as he walks through this door, seeing the wrong things happening, he, he walks through determined still to do the right thing. Now this doesn't wind up in two hours and it's all fixed and all is good for him. But this happens over years. I mean, he has this vision that he's going to be a great ruler and, and then he is up against it. Time after time after time, everything that could go wrong. Eventually, from the prison, he's summoned. He gets out of, of prison. And, and eventually, long story short, he becomes the second in command over all of Egypt. He, he was pulled back a little. Then he was pulled back a lot. And then he was, he was devastated. He was pulled and pulled and pulled to his breaking point. And God propelled him to a whole new level. Stop thinking. Stop saying. Stop believing that you know better than God. Even in the most awful circumstances, God has every desire to bring good out of it. Years later, the brothers are going through a famine. And they, they just see that it is the end, that there is no hope, there is nothing good, and they, they go to this Egyptian ruler to try to plead for just a little bit of help, a little bit of food. They don't even recognize Joseph anymore. And, and he happens to be the one who, who says, yeah, we'll, we'll give you some food, we'll, we'll look after you. He goes on to say, Joseph does, he says, what you meant for harm, well, what you meant for evil, what you meant against me, God meant for good. I was left in a pit to die. I was sold into slavery. I was wrongfully accused. I was wrongfully imprisoned. Problem, disappointment, darkness, mountains so big. And yet God propelled him at the end of his stretch to a whole new level. And he wants to do the same for each of you. You, you think you're at your breaking point? 
if you'll walk through this door and you will stay in faith believing. You will keep thinking. You will keep speaking. That it might happen tomorrow, but it might not. It might not even happen next week or, or next month or next year. It may be many years away. It may not happen on this side of eternity, but someday you, you will receive a propulsion. You, you will, will be moved to a new incredible level. Stop looking at the problems too closely. Stop, stop speaking about the problems so profusely. Stop, st stop all those things and, and allow God to propel you to a whole new level. Door number four. I mean, it's a tough one. But I, I know this, things will go wrong. But I also know this, that if you will open up that door, if you will step through with both feet, if you will be determined that even when things go wrong, I will serve God. I will get into agreement with the thoughts of God. I will speak. Speak even when everything's going wrong. The words that God would have me to speak. I know this. You'll start to experience the fullness of God. You'll open the door to God's best for you. And so as the band comes back in Bathurst and in Chatham and, and right here in Newcastle, I want to invite everyone, wherever you are, to stand. And I want to invite you, uh, I want to pray with all the sites, with everyone together today. So let's stand together. Lord Jesus, we pray in this moment, first and foremost, that you would forgive us. God, forgive us for, for doing things our way so often. God, forgive us for the times that we think that our ways and our ideas are, are bigger and better than Yours. And, and this day we submit to You. God, we ask You to not only forgive us for our sins, forgive us for the things we talk about and the things we think about sometimes that, that we ought to just get into agreement with You on. God, today we are determined, we have decided to step through this door that even if everything goes wrong, God, even if we're stretched to our limit, even if we feel like we're about to break, God, we will serve you all over these rooms. God, we're saying we will serve you. We will serve you. We will serve you no matter what. Even when things go wrong, we will serve you. Maybe you haven't even begun a relationship with Christ yet. This is your opportunity to be born again, to be adopted according to Scripture into His family simply by asking God to forgive you for inviting Jesus Christ to come into your life. Lord Jesus, come into our life. Come into my life right now. Move to the very center. Be my Lord. Help me to turn, to, to repent from going my way and to turn toward you. Lord Jesus, take over my life. Be my Lord and Savior, I pray. You know, if you pray that simple prayer in faith, believing you're now my brother, my sister in Christ. The Bible says that in Christ Jesus, we have the victory. As we sing these closing songs in Bathurst and in Chatham and right here in Newcastle, I'm going to ask that you come to the front at your site or right here. We're going to turn off the cameras here in a moment as we close this, this song. And I want to invite people to come and grab an elastic. And when you see this elastic, when it shows up in your pocket or in your purse or somewhere, and you feel like you are just being stretched, you know this. God is propelling you to a whole new level. God has something incredible for you. That the further you feel pulled back, the further He's ready to shoot you ahead to a whole new level.